Please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. The title of today's message is The Good Part. We just sang about the good part, our Redeemer, in whom is our satisfaction. We're talking about the good part today. We're talking about enjoying the good part. We enjoyed one of the many good parts of an elk last night, the tenderloin. There's a big difference between the tenderloin and a flank steak. There's a big difference between a foreleg and all that tendon and that beautiful loin. That's the good part. We know how to choose the good part. People like picking the good part when they understand what the good part is. If you have your Bible open to Luke 10, we're going to pick up the text in verse 38. As a lady chooses the good part by focusing on herself on Christ. Now, as they were traveling along, he, Christ, entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, who was also seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. You can imagine the joy of hearing from God incarnate as he reveals truth, as he instructs in the way of righteousness, as he tells her what is to come. And we're going to hear a little bit later what he told her, what, what she learned from being with him. But her sister Martha has opted for something else. Verse 40, Martha was distracted. With all her preparations, and you can imagine, she has the king of kings in her home. She wants to lay out the red carpet and do everything she can for him, be hospitable. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the preparations alone? Then tell her to help me. She's just loafing around. Listening to God Most High. Hmm. Verse 41. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, that repetition of her name is a term of endearment. He loves Martha. You are worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary for Mary has chosen the good part which will not be taken away from her she wants me I appreciate the honors and the honorariums and all the preparations but I want you Martha I want your attention Mary is giving it to me join us and, and she does, eventually. John chapter 11, verse 27, tells us about that. As her brother has been buried, you can turn here if you want. As her brother has been buried for several days, Martha runs to Jesus when she hears that he's coming and she is grieved. I'll, I'll pick it up actually in verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. <laughs> Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, ever. Do you believe this? Martha responds in faith. 
Verse 27, she said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who comes into the world. She ends up choosing the good part. She runs to Christ. She learned her lesson. We're going to learn a good lesson on choosing the good part today. Let's open in prayer. Yahweh God, to think that you would stoop, that you would humble yourself to redeem us and give us the very best. Your son is unfathomable. Lord, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Thank you for giving us you and bringing us near. Thank you for giving us a family with whom we have more in common than anyone else because we're united in Christ and we have his spirit. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be at work today, applying the word to our heart. May the world and its distractions and its idols pale in comparison with what we have in Christ. It's because of his blood and through the power of your spirit, we come. Amen. Today, we're in Psalm chapter 16. We're looking at the good part today. We're looking at what David delights in. And just a bit of context before we jump into these 11 verses. This is a miktam of David. Now, that's not an English word. That's not something we know and understand. A miktam, if you read through the Psalms, you'll see that in Psalm 16 and a few of the Psalms in the 50s. Uh, nobody definitively knows what miktam means, but linguistic analysis directs many people to understand that this is like an inscription or a cutting. Uh, you can imagine uh, an assayer stamping a brick of gold, 24 karat, one kilogram, a, like a, a big inscription on there so you know what it's about. It's something that has value associated with it. It's something that's not meant to fade away. You can imagine a headstone with an inscription on it. Here lies thus and such a faithful brother loving mother. It's something that's supposed to stay. David has something that is to remain. He has something to say about the good part. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. The text is broken into four sections, and I'll tell you now what those are. We're talking about David's security, his satisfaction, his stability, and his salvation. Verses 1 through 3 is David's security. And his first words, as he writes them down, are a groaning, a sigh. It's one line in Hebrew. Shamarona el ki chasachate vach. Keep me, O oh God, for I take refuge in you. This is his heart. And in the middle of the night, David, this is the, what wells up out of him. God, I take refuge in you. We looked at that last week, taking refuge in Christ. This is his theme. God is his refuge. O oh, my soul, verse 2, you have said to Yahweh, you are my Lord. I have no good without you. As for the saints who are in the earth, they're the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. Yahweh, God, is David's security. 
He's his place of refuge. To be kept is to be guarded, to be secured, to be made safe. And David is safe in the arms of the Lord. Can we say that? Can we say that we are safe in the arms of the Lord? Can we say that the highest good of us, the thing that we most focus on, is the Lord? That my good is not higher than God or better than God or besides Him? Is God alone without any exception, our highest delight, David can. Can we say that? The world is very distracting. There's a lot of idols. We know this. We live here. We see them. David's highest delight is the Lord, and that delight pours out of him and extends to the covenant-keeping people of God that are around him. He says, as for the saints who are in the earth, verse 3, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. Does our love for God and our love for our neighbors, do they flow out of each other? Is it because we love God that we love our neighbors? Is he our highest delight? Many of us have shared with me, I've heard statements of us that out of exasperation, out of frustration, with people who are Christians, that people are not our highest delight. Uh, They go cross-grain. They bother us. Do we love one another? We've been called to. 1 John 4, verse 20 is instructive. If we can't say, if we say that we love God, but our highest delight is not in him and in those that he has redeemed, there's a disconnect, okay? 1 John 4.20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. You can't really prove your love for God unless you do what he says. He commanded us to love one another. That is our defining characteristic as Christians. And David, David demonstrates this love. He calls the covenant-keeping people of God the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. Christian, the outflow of your love for God will be a love for his beloved. Verses four through five are our second point. It's David's satisfaction. And you can see a contrast in verses four through five as we see people who find their satisfaction in the world, its idols, its distractions, its entertainments, versus what David has received, what he is satisfied with. Verse 4 of Psalm 16, the pains of those who have bartered for another will, will another God will be multiplied. I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. Yahweh is my portion, is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. There's a contrast. Those who are idolaters and David, whose inheritance is the Lord. Look closely at verse 4. There's several things I want to pull out. I'm just going to probably mention a couple. Is the word God in verse 4, partway through it, for another God, is that in italics in your text? 
it might be that word is not written there in the Hebrew text. It's in italics. It's added because the context tells us that David is referring to another God, but he doesn't, it's not there. Why isn't it there? And how do we know? Because he says at the end of verse four, I'm not gonna take their names upon my lips. God himself had forbidden his people from even mentioning the name of other gods. You'll, you'll notice in, in Exodus 20, verse three, the commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 23, 13, don't even mention false gods. Why? They're a nothing. They're a vain thing. We explored that last week. 1 Corinthians 10, 19, Paul says they're a nothing. They have no worth. And those that seek after these idols, their pains are multiplied. That, that emphasis, the, their pains are multiplied, that brings to mind Genesis chapter 3. What was Eve told after she had rebelled against God? She had swallowed the, the bait of Satan when he said, oh, you can be just like God. She had an idol of elevating herself, and she rebelled against God. She swallowed hook, line, and sinker the entire bait. And the sentence, the judgment, was that her pain at, at birth would be multiplied. When sin has given birth, it brings forth death. There's a contrast between those that are seeking after a vain thing, a nothing, and those whose highest delight is the Lord. Satan gave Eve death. God gave life. Who is going to give you your highest delight? It is not, I repeat, not the idol that is distracting you. You say, I don't have idols. Really? You are a rarity among humanity. We have Idols. We talked about a few of them. Here's some more in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, verse 5. If you want to turn there, you can. Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Are we greedy? Yeah, we are greedy. A little more, please. Pile it on. We live in a greedy nation. We live at a greedy time. Passion, impurity, sexual immorality. Yeah, that happens in the church too. It does. Those are legitimate idols. They're a nothing. They are not worthy compared to the Lord. There's such a contrast here between pain and idolatry and nothingness versus Yahweh, the giver of all good gifts. Please remember this. This is a principle I want to leave with you. Rejection and rebellion of the Lord comes at a great cost. Eve ate some fruit and we have a death sentence now. Every single one of us. It's just a little, it's just a pie of fruit. He said no. Sin, idolatry, it does not give what it promises. Yahweh, verse 5, is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. David is satisfied with what the Lord has given him. What did the Lord give David? Well, he gave him a covenant. He also gave him a heritage, an inheritance. We think inheritance and we think, what am I going to get when so-and-so dies? And that's our context. For the Hebrew, inheritance 
it refers back to many different things. Haaretz, the land. The land was their inheritance. Their land, not only that, but also the covenants between Yahweh and Abraham and Moses. It was their heritage. It connected them with promises given. And it's a stewardship that will be maintained until the next generation. The inheritance, these gifts, are of grace. God didn't have to do that. And yet he has brought David near. He has brought him close. And that's why he's pouring out of his soul. I love you. I want you. You are my highest delight. Deuteronomy 32 says that Yahweh's people are his inheritance. There's a back and forth. And we're going to see that take place in relation to the, the right hand metaphor that is mentioned later. They have been purchased by the Lord. Revelation 5, 9 shows the nations gathered together, those whom he has redeemed, purchased by the Lord for the Lord from every tribe and tongue bought with his son's blood. Why is David satisfied with Yahweh? Because he has eyes that are open. He sees the nothingness of the idols. He won't even mention their name because they're so unworthy. <laughs> and he has eyes that can see his highest delight, his greatest good. He can see the good part. He has gotten the good part. And he knows that that is why he has received stability. That's what comforts him in the night. That's what pours out of him in the darkness. Verses 6 through 8 are David's stability. Verse 6. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my inheritance is beautiful to me. I will bless Yahweh who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set Yahweh continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. David is stabilized. When the anxious worries well up in his mind in the middle of the night, David is a hunted man. He is an endangered man, constantly imperiled. How many times did he escape death from Saul? He wasn't eaten by the lion or the bear. He wasn't killed by Goliath. His own children rose up against him. He is stabilized. Because he knows whom he has. He has the good part. He has the Lord. And he blesses the Lord in the night. Let's see here. That that line at the end of verse 6. Let me just re read that again. Indeed, my inheritance is beautiful to me. He is expressing a sense of deep inward pleasure that he has received the Lord. And not only the Lord's providence, thank you for these gifts, he's expressing that he enjoys the Lord's proximity, his closeness. I talked about last week, what are some of the attributes of, of finding out that you have an idol in your life. Your relationship with the Lord becomes tired. It gets cold. It gets lifeless. It's not hot. It's not fresh. It's not new. It's just grinding. That is a good indicator that there is an idol. David doesn't have that. It is he has deep inward pleasure 
at the Lord's proximity and his providence. And he blesses the Lord, verse 7, in the night. Psalm 119, have you read Psalm 119? It came up several times this week in conversation. Psalm 119, if you know the psalm, you know what I'm going to talk about. Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, is all about meditating and pouring over the Lord's statutes. They are good. His commandments, they are righteous. His laws, they are pure. They are holy. I want your precepts. Is that what our mind gravitates to in the night? What do we meditate on in the night? When our anxious thoughts well up, one of the ways that we can reset is by meditating on the Lord and what he has instructed. That practice of meditating on what is pure and right and lovely and above reproach, that gives you a familiarity so you know where that tool is when you're jolted awake. What about so-and-so? What about tomorrow? How am I gonna, when that happens, you can train your mind to go to the good part and to reset. And I do this. And like a baby, I zonk right out because I, he's still there. My salvation is secure. That heinous sin that just happened that I repented of, he paid for it. And it's not going to be taken away. He has redeemed me. Indeed, he has brought me close and I will not be shaken. Here's a principle I want to leave with you. Closeness to the Lord is going to bring that stability. You draw near. If, that is a, if there is a stagnant relationship with the Lord, have the indicator go off. Warning sign. Danger. This is a sign I need to reorient. I've shelved the good part and gotten busy over here like Martha. Don't get busy doing a bunch of religious stuff. It's easy for people in ministry, Gary will attest, to getting too busy and getting pulled in so many different directions. Only one thing is necessary. What is required? The good part. That's what I want. I want the ribeye. I don't want the skirt steak. I'll eat it and I will say thank you. But I want the ribeye. I want the fat ribeye with horseradish on the side and I want it hot. The good part. I got meat on the mind. I'm hungry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, verses 9 through 11 is the salvation. Verse 9, therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell in security. In security. It was just a few verses back. He was like, I need you. And then he's reset. Verse 10, you will not forsake my soul to Sheol, the grave, the pit, Hades. I'm not going there. You will not give your Holy One over to see corruption. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forever. David knows who his salvation is. This text is quoted twice in Acts. It's a critical text. And it was used in the conversion of 3,000 people in Acts chapter 2. 
when Peter was preaching on the Holy One who would not see decay. That was his case in point. That the resurrection is reality. The Sadducees of Jesus' day, they mocked, they laughed at the idea of angels and a resurrection from the dead. They were wrong. God is the God of the living. <laughs> We're gonna, I'm going to go back to that text in a little bit uh, if I have time. I don't have time. I might make time. <laughs> but David, he knows his salvation is with the Lord. He knows that Christ holds the keys of death and Hades. That's what Revelation 1.18 says. David was delivered from the grave. He was delivered from the pit. He was delivered from attacks. He has experienced the Lord's salvation. Christian, so have you. If you are a Christian, you have eternal life now. You have experienced new life. You have experienced deliverance now. That's not something you're waiting for. You have it now. It's a promise. The indwelling of God's Holy Spirit stamps his seal. That is true. When God is applying his word to your life, that's more proof. You're being delivered. You're being delivered from vanity, from idolatry, from nothingness to the good part. The Lord. And that is David's gladness. Here's a fact, a fact that we can't help but reiterate. The righteous, those who are holy, those that are redeemed, they do not go to Sheol. They do not go to Hades. They do not go to the pit. No, they go to paradise. I will refer to Luke 16 verses 19 through 31 and Luke 23 verse 43 as definitive proof that that is the case. Christ said so. The righteous do not go to the pit. It cannot happen. It is impossible for it to happen. <laughs> That's just stability. That in the night gives the stability. It is impossible, this is our final principle, it is impossible for the one who trusts in Yahweh to fall into the hands of eternal death. Cannot happen. If that were possible, God would not be God. His word would be null. It would be worthless, and he would be a liar. He is not a liar. He is not. What he has said is true. The proof is true. Christ, whom the Bible says several times in Colossians 1.18, uh, Revelation 1.5, that he is the firstborn from the dead. He's the first. He isn't the last. More are coming. We will be raised. The resurrection is an incontrovertible fact. And it goes all throughout Scripture. Oh, my goodness. I've got 11 texts that I could go into, and I would love to go into. There's not enough time. It's repeated over and over and over. The resurrection is a reality. The proof is Christ. The Lord showed us with himself. Mm. Sometimes that's hard to believe. Let's go to Mark 12. Mark 12. I alluded to the uh, Pharisee, or the Sadducees. Why were they sad? Somebody's been in Sunday school. I know. I know you know. You grow up reading that. <laughs> they were sad, you see. Mark 12. Verse 24, the 
the whole passage is about uh, the Sadducees mocking the Lord and setting him up to uh, fall into a, a, a trap <laughs> that seems to prove, logically speaking, that there can't be a resurrection from the dead. Jesus says in verse 24, you don't believe this? You don't get it? Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are mistaken that you do not understand the scriptures, nor the power of God? Christian, do you not understand the scriptures? Do you not hold them close? Do you not grab onto them as a lifeline, as the proof that what God has said he will do there is a resurrection for those who are righteous. There is a future for those who are found in Christ. Are you found in Christ? You are not going to choose the bad part. Don't choose the worthless, vain idol that is a nothing. Choose the good part. You will prove that with your love to one another. I will see that lived out when you heap on love for one another, when there's unity within the family. There's proof. I'm going to close with verse 11, which was the main point, the latter half of verse 11. You will make known to me the path of life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Is he not? John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father except through him. Amen, Diab, right? I know that. In your presence, this is the main point. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. The right hand is the close part. It's the part you use every day. Do you use your right hand? I know Tim missed the use of his right hand. You need it. You don't go a day without using it. It is close. It's the place of honor. It's the place of power within you. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. The Lord invites us. He engages us to come and enjoy the hyperabundance of grace available through him. Have you picked the good part? Don't be satisfied with trinkets. Satan is a liar. Eve got taken. We could see it. She rebelled. She ran after vain things. And we're paying the cost just as she paid. Don't be mistaken. The choice is clear. Choose the good part. We looked at a number of principles here. We looked at the reject that rejection and rebellion come at a great cost. We could see that in Eve. We can see that closeness to the Lord, familiar, familiarity with him and his word, brings stability at those most unstable of times. And you know what those look like. We also looked at the fact that it is impossible for the one who trusts in Yahweh to fall into the hands of eternal death. I want you to ruminate on these facts, these principles. They are worthy of meditating on. God's word is worth way more than my principles to meditate on. And I pray that you do. Spend time with the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Lord, you are the most satisfying. We were made for you in your image, to enjoy you, and life eternal, you have promised it. To those who believe in faith, to those who are found in Christ, 
Oh, Lord, may we persevere. May we live out our faith. May this body grow. May we manifest our love to you by loving your saints. Oh, Lord, may we be found in Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen.